Well, two years ago, the United States Supreme Court decided the case of Al Smith, a member of the Klamath tribe, an Oregonian, and a sincere adherent of a Native American religion that for hundreds of years has included as one of its sacraments, could outlaw the use of peyote by any of its citizens, including good faith religious adherents like Mr. Smith. I should add a footnote, last year the Oregon legislature did enact a law that allows religious use of peyote as a defense to prosecution for its possession. Well, this is a tough First Amendment freedom of religion question. Can the state, for example, constitutionally outlaw the practice of human sacrifice, even though the practice is religiously based, and in fact is reported still to take place in parts of the Americas? But at the other end of the spectrum, what if the state, and what would the reaction be if the state in defining criminal child abuse chose to include circumcision of male babies? Freedom of religion isn't always easy to define. Today's speaker sees a need for reform at the federal level to ensure Native American religious freedom rights. Vine Deloria, Jr., our speaker today, has a fascinating personal resume that runs to 13 pages and takes us from his birth into the Standing Rock tribe of the Sioux Nation in South Dakota, through the United States Marine Corps, Iowa State University, the University of Colorado Law School, and to his present position as Professor of American Indian Studies and Adjunct Professor of Law at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He serves on numerous boards and councils. He is, among other things, founder of the Institute for the Development of Indian Law in Washington, D.C. He's written very extensively several books, including the well-known book, Custer Died for Your Sins, and he is, of course, internationally known for his expertise in Native American religious matters. I might add, having had the chance to chat with him during the time before I uh, got up to introduce him, he's a delightful person to talk with, too. I think this is going to be a, an informative and interesting and a very worthwhile presentation. So please join me in welcoming to City Club Mr. Vine Deloria, Jr. Thank you very much. Uh, as most of you know, we've brought a lot of uh, Indian people from around the country here because we're having hearings tomorrow uh, on what we hope would be a series of hearings on American Indian religious freedom. Uh, some of these people are much more famous than I am. I'd like to mention a few of them, have them stand up. Uh, Al Smith is in the audience, and if your attorney general is going to go around and bother uh, elders like that, you ought to at least know what he looks like. So Al would... <laughs> Uh, I'd like to introduce also Pat Lefthan, who is the only American Indian that I know of who has won a Religious Freedom Sacred Sites Access case. He is from the Kootenai Tribe, and I'd like to have you. <laughs> and then there's Walter Echohawk, who is the finest legal mind in Indian law at the present time. I'd like to have Walter stand up. And then I'd like to introduce Marlon Brando, <laughs> but he's not here. <laughs> uh, I'd like to introduce James Botsford, who is uh, the lead counsel for Native American Church nationally and has uh, been working uh, 36 hours a day about the last six months to get these things ready. Jim, would you stand up? Now, these television things are in my eyes, so I can't pick out any more of you, so uh, I apologize. I can identify uh, those people, and you'll see a lot of them the next couple of days. Uh, so I thought you ought to have some idea uh, who they were. A at any rate, on behalf of all those people, uh, I would like to thank the City Club for uh, allowing us to come the day before the hearing. And... Uh, <clears throat> present our case. I, uh, we're sure getting more time from you than we're getting from the United States Senate tomorrow, let me tell you. <laughs> but that's okay. They can't understand very many things, and so you got to just do one thing at a time with them. Uh, <clears throat> always regretted the, uh, re the retirement of Tom Eagleton. Uh, 
He was the only member of the U.S. Senate who was ever certified sane by competent legal, uh, medical authorities. So, <laughs> so uh, the uh, American Indian religious freedom question is uh, extremely complicated, and I would like to take uh, a different view than some of the people I've introduced. They're, they're concerned with articulating uh, some of the specific things that, that concern us. Uh, <clears throat> I look at our problem as uh, more your problem than it is our problem. And I don't say that to try and raise uh, your consciousness and make you feel guilty. Uh, <clears throat> I say that because the present configuration of the Supreme Court uh, really is not people-oriented. Those justices now are all in favor of the state in any form they can give power to the state. And the state is mostly you people. Uh, American Indians are living out in the most godforsaken, isolated places in the world. A lot of what happens in domestic America does not reach us. So, so when I talk about, about serious problems, it's things they're going to hit you more than they're going to hit us. Now, along about the mid-60s, there was this feeling that minorities had somehow gotten too much. And so the Republican Party, and I want to place it on parties, it's time Americans got their heads out of their rear ends and got their heads out of the sand and looked at things honestly. Code words like law and order were a deliberate effort to generate bad racial feelings. Strict constructionists for the Supreme Court in effect, meant reactionary justices put on there to stop minority groups. Now, what had minority groups done by the mid-60s? They had, after a century after the Civil War, they had finally made it into the American social contract enough so they could go to Woolworths in the South and have a cherry Coke without being arrested. So they could ride a Greyhound bus from one southern state to another so they can move out of this very situation that you've described in your report as of 1957. So it's really unfair to say that minorities were taking things away from whites. But that's what Nixon appealed to in 68. And that's what conservatives have appealed to ever since. The net result, by 1980, you had some very reactionary justices on the court. The people in Congress didn't examine these people to see if they were scholars. If the person, if there was insufficient evidence to indict a nominee, that was as good as having him the highest moral character in the world. You know that. <laughs> you know that. We've had a series of attorney generals that would have, ordinarily would have gone 30 years in jail if they hadn't been affiliated with the, the White House. At any rate, those justices have been told in one way or another, or they grew up thinking, their job when they got the Supreme Court was to stop any progress by minority. Since the Reagan-Bush years, we now have almost all of the court with that mindset. If you look at the two Indian cases we're concerned about, the Ling case and the Smith case, in neither of those instances was there really any reason to take that case before the Supreme Court. The court should not have accepted either one. The road that was supposed to be built down in Northern California was virtually negated by the California Wilderness Act. There were no plans to even go forward with it. I think those justices thought they were put on the court to keep minorities from getting anything, and by God, they were going to decide those cases. So they take Ling up, and they say, even if we destroy a religion, that's not really burdening it. And that strikes very directly at American Indians. Well, then you get the Smith case here. And I was afraid to go out of the hotel this afternoon, or this morning, for fear that thousands of Indian drug dealers would accost me on the streets. And I know, <laughs> I know it's a real serious problem here in, in Portland. 
When I think of your attorney general taking that case to the Supreme Court, with the exception of the Indians here in this room, most of the non-Indians would have a very difficult time even finding an Indian in Portland. You don't live in the same neighborhoods, you don't attend the same schools, you don't do the same thing. But the chance of you finding an Indian who was a member of the Native American church are even more obscure. And the chance of you finding an Indian of the Native American church who happened to have peyote on him at the time are infinitesimally against you. <laughs> and yet if I dismiss this group right now, and I tell you, go out and get me cocaine, heroin, or opium. You wouldn't have to walk more than a mile, and you wouldn't have to spend more than an hour to get it. Isn't that right? So we got to look at the practicality, the reality of what the American situation is. At any rate, the Smith case goes up. Scalia so we don't need to balance anything anymore wiped out for all practical purposes the First Amendment. Now who does that affect? We, uh, Walter Echohawk and myself, have been trying to keep a running count of which religious groups are injured after that decision and on the basis of that. And Indians have won two cases involving Native American church, one in Texas and one in New Mexico. But it's the Christian and Jewish denominations that are really catching it on the basis of the Smith decision. They are really being injured. Autopsies are now possible on members of those faiths whose faith prohibit cutting up the human body. Your president mentioned circumcision. Bevies of legal scholars right now are questioning if a statute has to be neutral, can there be exemptions for communion wine in it? See, now, we didn't gain a thing in the 60s in terms of the Bill of Rights. All we gained was the ground we never had from the Civil War forward. So now you've got reactionary justices who are reaching in the First Amendment and other amendments. They're going to tear everything up, thinking they're doing injury to minority groups. And what they're doing injury to is the rank-and-file white citizen to put them there. Those are the people that are going to suffer. If you look back a year ago, they have a decision, forced confessions are all right. About a month ago, in a 72 ruling, they said a prisoner who had been severely beaten by prison guards was handcuffed, that this was really a an un cruel and unusual punishment. But two dissenters, Clarence, Clarence Thomas and Scalia, implied that there had to be permanent damage before it was unconstitutional. So you got a runaway Supreme Court in this country, a Supreme Court that minimally does not understand what the effects of its rulings are or are going to be and probably doesn't care what they're going to be. Now into this situation come American Indians. One half of one percent of the population. And this is the thing that we have to tell American society and would like to tell American society. That we don't belong in the middle of First Amendment controversies. We are related to the United States of America through treaties and agreements. Because of those treaties and agreements, Congress has the power to pass laws dealing exclusively with American Indians. And that's why we're having the hearings tomorrow. If we can articulate all of our needs in the religious freedom area, if we can get tremendous support, and I hope your two Oregon senators We'll get off the fence and become co-sponsors of this. If we can get our Indian legislation through, at Supreme Court traditionally has said, Congress has plenty, plenary power in this field 
the Congress determines on the basis of existing federal Indian law will be the law affecting American Indians. Now, laws affecting us are not going to affect any of you unless you want to come on the reservations and get embroiled in a big jurisdictional controversy. But these laws are necessary to take the Indian religious question, once and for all, put it beyond the reach of the Supreme Court, in the sense that the Supreme Court will thereafter, in looking at Indian case, have to follow federal Indian law and not embroil us in First Amendment case law issues. And unless that happens, any reforms that are made in First Amendment law, and several are, are pending now, any of those reforms will be negated by the very next Indian case that goes to the Supreme Court. Because in order to rule against us, they will have to take whatever is existing law and they have to twist it again. So when we're having hearings tomorrow, the basic thrust is to protect the religious rights of all Americans. What has to be done in the context of federal Indian law. Now, I'd like to move to the theological basis of what we talk about when we talk about Indian religious freedom. The vast majority of Indian tribes, and I don't know offhand of any that would not hold this view, the vast majority knew, saw, felt, and experienced the universe as a living entity. And for thousands of years, living in the North American continent, traditional people, medicine people, medicine men and women, were able to communicate with other forms of life, whether they were rocks or trees or birds or other kinds of animals. They were able to communicate with areas of the land itself. In over thousands of years, ceremonies came into being. And part of those ceremonies involved the fact that human beings alone were able to articulate with and communicate with all other forms of life. So human beings were designated to perform ceremonies and rituals on behalf of all other forms of life. And those are the ceremonies that come down. Those are the ceremonies that Al Smith and others were doing. Now those ceremonies fall on Indian people to conduct because the earth itself and all its life forms need to be related to each other, need to be spiritually sound, and need to be fulfilling themselves and pointing the universe in a positive direction. And it kind of irritates a lot of us that the issue of whether we should have access to sacred lands implies that we are trying to establish the Indian religion above all other religions. I talked to an elder about this problem. And he said, well, we've got to make it clear we're not going out to these isolated places to pray for Cadillacs or white loss or any of the things that the Christians are praying for. <laughs> say, well, we're going out there to pray for all of mankind and, and the earth, and that's who we're praying for. We do not want to be wealthier. We do not want to drive BMWs. Uh, <clears throat> I said, well, I would try and convey that message, but... <clears throat> Since the Christian God now is, is it trying to extort money out of Oral Roberts, it may be kind of difficult to <laughs> <laughs> present this. Now, our continent was invaded by your ancestors. A lot of them came over here seeking religious freedom. But they also came over here with uh, a European form of the Michelangelo virus. <laughs> and, and that was a belief that the universe operated like a machine. And that has proven immensely useful in science. But we're now seeing a great rebellion among the younger generation of scientists that the analogy of the machine 
not adequately describe the physical world. And if you treat the physical world as if it were a machine, from time to time it's going to break down. I particularly like your local paper. I've seen two issues of it in the science section. I would rec recommend you all read it. New use for mushrooms or indicator species. As mushrooms vanish, this shows larger trees are going to vanish because a mushroom is the integral part of the whole forest ecology. You ought to read that in today's paper. Uh, at any rate, the machine theory could not pick that up. See, but Indian medicine man, knowing the mushrooms and talking with the mushrooms, would assure you that right away. I don't want to get too far into your spotted owl controversy, but uh, you can't treat the rainforest like a machine. The spotted owl is an indicator. And when that animal leaves, there may be a whole other bunch of things would leave also. At any rate, your ancestors in coming over impose a mechanical view on human knowledge. As I say, this has been immensely successful in technological terms until about the last decade when we started to wake up. Almost all the federal laws that we deal with are based on those mechanical terms. And that is why peyote is classified in Western classifications along with drugs which are reprocessed manufactured drugs and certainly are dangerous. It's extremely difficult for us to try and get non-Indians to see. The use of peyote is very comparable to how tribes use tobacco, how tribes use water, how tribes use salmon, how tribes use all of the other natural things. That is a natural use of plants. Western scientific categories don't have enough categories so you can understand that. And consequently, access to sacred sites, prisoners' rights, use of burden animal parts, use of peyote, all testify to a living universe, a universe in which every part of the universe has to be responsible to perform its duties to other parts of the universe. And what we see when your ancestors come over is they don't want to take responsibility. They want a society of rights in which if I infringe on you, then I can go and sue you in a court and get the institutions to uh, punish you or control your behavior. Now, in the last year, we have gone across the country and tried to appeal on the basis of good faith to many of the religious groups that are also affected by the Smith decision. There is a Solars coalition made up of the major Christian and Jewish groups. And they summarily dismissed American Indian representation in their coalition on the basis that almost anything that we would want protected would be too controversial. To my knowledge, none of them are willing to step back and say, what is a religion? And Indians represent a living religion, and the rest of us represent a religion which sees the universe as dead and mechanistic. And why can't we support them and protect their religion while we sort out our problems? At any rate, the national churches, for the most part, don't want to talk to us, don't want to discuss the issues, dodging us on every occasion. Uh, I'm particularly ashamed of some of these churches because I know their history. And some of them were very good missionaries to Indians, and others probably burned and killed your great-grandparents at Salem, Massachusetts. So I don't think there's any of these groups that, that come to the American public without a lot of dirt and blood on their hands. But one of the fears they and other people express is that if you recognize American Indian religion at all, you are establishing a church. And therefore, we can't have anything to do with American Indian religion. And that fear comes from the European experience where there was 
persecution for religious belief. But there is certainly a big difference between allowing five or six Indians exclusive use of a peak in California three or four days a year and establish church religion as it has been practiced in the United States during American history. There is a radical difference, and I want to show you what it is. I got this book at a used bookstore, and this deals with the instruments of torture used in the Inquisition. These are instruments one group of Christians used against another group of Christians because they disagreed on theological problems. And this is a very interesting I don't think the TV camera can catch it, but certainly some of you can catch this. It's a little clamp that you put over people's heads and then you start screwing it down. <clears throat> Let me read you. All comment seems superfluous. First, the teeth are crushed into their sockets and smash the surrounding bone. Then the eyes are forced out of their sockets. Finally, the brain squirts through the fragmented skull. It's an instrument of torture that an established religion could and would use against people it disagreed with. Here's the wheel. Now, this is a familiar instrument of torture among both Protestants and Catholics. Let me tell you how they do this. The victim stripped naked, stretched out on the ground with his or her limbs spread. The executioner then smashes limb after limb, joint after joint, including the shoulders and hips with the iron edge of the wheel, avoiding fatal blows. The victim was transformed according to the observations of a 17th century German chronicler into sort of a huge screaming puppet writhing in rivulets of blood, a puppet with four tentacles like a sea monster of raw, slimy, shapeless flesh mixed up with splinters of bone. I thought you'd appreciate this after a good lunch. <clears throat> Thereafter, the shattered limbs were braided into the spokes of the large wheel. Victim hoisted up horizontally to the top of a pole where the crows ripped away bits of flesh and pecked out the eyes. Death came after what was probably the longest, most atrocious agony that the ingeniousness of the power structure could inflict. Now that's what your ancestors fled in Europe. And you can't hardly blame them, can you? <laughs> and that was possible to have this kind of stuff in colonial America. And when they adopted the Bill of Rights, they didn't want this kind of thing happening in America. The Constitutional Fathers put the Bill of Rights together and they said, the state shall not establish a religion. See, now in those discussions, they never said the most heinous of all things could happen would be five Indians might want to go on public land and hold a prayer for the earth. And we better provide for that. They see, we've got to get this country to realize all the bickering legislation about the interpretation of that phrase, this is the kind of stuff they were trying to stop. They didn't much care if you had a crash in the courthouse lawn or if you mentioned the deity when you're having a graduation speech. That wasn't what they were into. They're trying to stop this stuff. And the courts had gone way out of their way to derive every conceivable nuance on the Establishment Clause. I think that clause is the one we're going to really have to fight. But there's a great deal of difference between what this represents and what American Indians are asking for, which is under treaties and agreements, under the trust relationship, we need the strongest law possible 
to defend the rituals and ceremonies that we have carried down for thousands and thousands of years. And that's why we're here in Portland. And if you people don't help us get our legislation through, everything is just going to drift the way it is at the present time. Your churches nationally, on a statewide basis, and locally are going to lose cases they never should have lost because of the doctrines created by the Smith case. And we are going to continue to fight for Indian religious freedom, and another case of ours will surely reach the Supreme Court. If you don't help us articulate the fact that we relate the United States by treaty and agreement, that Congress then passes federal legislation to deal with our problems, that doesn't affect you, and what you do shouldn't affect us. If well, that's not made clear, those Supreme Court justices are going to reach in and rip out the rest of the Bill of Rights, thinking that they're turning us back, thinking that they're denying us special privileges. You good non-Indian people who are living in, meeting in clubs like this, You've got to get out there and ring some alarm bells about what, what's going on in this country. you got to help us get our religious freedom identified and protected so that that court doesn't come after us. Because every time it comes after us, it hits you. And you've got a lot more to lose than we do. At the present time, if you had fair and impartial administration of the laws of the federal government and every state, most of the mainstream religious bodies would be uh, prohibited. The exemption for communion wine makes the statute not neutral, and therefore it would be prohibited. If we don't act and get things moving, do you want me to tell you what it's going to be like four years from now? Four years from now, Indian reservations are going to be the only place you'll have religious freedom because we have our own sovereignty. And you know what the irony is going to be? Your ancestors came over here 500 years ago for religious freedom, and 500 years later, you're going to have to go to Indian reservations in order to pray in peace. So when we finish this, you get on the phone to uh, Hatfield and Packwood and the various candidates, and you make this number one issue for them. You know, let's get this thing turned around. Thank you. speaker's prepared remarks, I erred. He used no notes. That was obviously a, an address from the mind and the heart. Thank you, Mr. Deloria. Our first question will be asked by member host today, Helen Goodwin. One of the things that you spoke about in your remarks was the differences in cultures between the American and Indian community and the majority community. And certainly one of the things that our report alluded to was a need for cultural sensitivity training and having that become a norm in the way people operated in the majority community. What ideas do you have for promoting cultural sensitivity and making the majority community more aware and sensitive to the needs of the Indians? Uh, well, this may not be a very intelligent response. I think you, you see different solutions depending on what age you are. And you can see I'm getting quite old. And uh, uh, I, I kind of think that uh, people like Pat Buchanan are, are trying to smear over a lot of what's happened in American history. Uh, 
there's some parts of multiculturalism I'm not comfortable with, but I, I like the idea of, of forums where you really do learn the history of, of the United States, uh, the good parts and the bad parts. Because only through a historical appreciation of what the human experience has been do you come to like other human beings. And uh, I'm teaching a course in Colorado right now, Native American Christianity. And I try and balance it between the good missionaries, both of them, and the bad missionaries, most of them. <laughs> and, uh, but, but the thing is, if, if you have one shining moment of, of good human concern, it, that often makes up for a lot of, uh, of bad problems. Uh, too often when we say learn more about American Indians, uh, the result is you're just overwhelmed on the reservation with, with people that come streaming out there to learn something. Mm -hmm. and, and Indians got to make a living. Uh, you, you can't sit in front of the post office educating people all day long. <laughs> Walter does, but we got a big post office <laughs> in Boulder. What, what I'd like to see is, is, is kind of an expanded version of what you do here in, in the city club. Uh, to Indian and non-Indian audiences, I try and stress that uh, television and communications takes us away from each other. So, so we all become individual units of a machine. We don't become people anymore. Uh, in small community organizations or community meetings or occasional storytelling by elders or uh, investigation of, of historical situations, uh, if you, we begin to see ourselves as part of a stream of humanity that, that's been kept apart by ideological differences quite often. Uh, and, and it has good and very bad things happening to it. Uh, I think we need to sensitize ourselves. And then if you're really sensitive, uh, an issue that can be presented sharply, as I hope I've tried to present religious freedom today, uh, you can empathize with and you can see how it affects you and you can move on it. So. That would kind of be my answer at the present time. When I was much younger, I would just say, uh, <clears throat> let us have about half a dozen of your atomic bombs and we'll duke it out. But <laughs> now that I've paid Social Security for 40 years, I don't want to do that. So. Yes, Professor Deloria, Deloria Mark yeah. Anderson, chair of the club's committee on arts and culture. and. Just for your information, also have some experience with uh, what is known as Indian law, having worked with the Navajo Nation a while ago. You've made some very, very provocative comments, uh, both with regard to Native Americans and to the rest of us about our First Amendment freedoms. <coughs> what I'd like to do is kind of take a step back and put that into another kind of context, which is the long-standing struggle uh, with the United States and the various tribes and nations what many have described as a cycle of uh, either eradication, removal, uh, isolation, or assimilation. And we've had those trends throughout our couple hundred years of trying to deal with each other. And where are we on that cycle? Is this particular legislation uh, an attempt to sort of break out of that uh, assimilation, isolation sort of curve? Uh, what, you know, where are we going with all of this, and, and where do you see uh, this, this going, particularly given your description of uh, an administration that's going to try to administer these laws? Uh, and I'm sure many of the people here know that uh, the tribes and nations have long had battles with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is uh, supposed to be executing these laws. What are our well, chances? the Bureau of Indian Affairs is executing something. I don't know what it is. I think it's us. <laughs> Uh, well, this, this is a very strange time in, in American history, and uh, I think Indians are just about down as far as we can go. When you're in a situation where a culture 10 or 20,000 years old is forced to operate bingo games in order to feed their children, that's about as far as you can go. So I think we're on the rebound. I don't believe it's possible for the United States to save itself. I think the United States is in for 
you know, just total collapse. Uh, we're, we're highly in uh, national debts outrageous. None of the candidates I've seen on any level have any vision about what's going to happen to the country. We're in the $400 billion deficit this year, and they're not making us pay taxes, so we'll jolly up the administration, and then we're all going to get penalties next year. Everything our institutions seem to do, universities, our government, uh, businesses, everything seems to be an ad hoc short-term basis to cover up the fact we don't know what we're doing. In that setting, I'm very proud of Indian tribes because we seem to know what we're doing. And we're headed in, in, in new directions. Uh, so we're going to emerge intact as communities. But large portions of this country are, are really going to go under. And whether then the change of domestic laws that will be required to solve the problems of the majority affect us, it's going to be touch and go. We do need a major revolution in federal Indian law. We need to add a historical dimension to it, which points out Northwest Ordinance 1787 said uh, we will not try and take their lands unless in just wars we would consult them in everything we do. Uh, attorneys have to articulate that as the standard to which the United States is held, instead of going to the martial decisions and saying you're a domestic nation. So I look for Indian societies and reservations that come through this coming depression in very good shape. It will maybe, uh, we'll, we will be hit hard economically. Maybe it'll teach us to feed each other like we used to instead of, instead of acting like uh, non-Indians so often. Uh, in Indian law, we need to work very hard to change the terms of the discussion. But I, I really feel sorry for people in non-Indian institutions. The, the most traumatic thing that I saw in the last year, I, I visited a Roman Catholic, uh, what used to be a nunnery. It's now a conference center uh, where you're trying to attract businessmen to come and talk about stuff. You can't support it. Uh, I stopped by there for a day. And in the evening, I was out having a cigarette because, you know, you can't smoke any place except me and God are the only ones that commune that way. <coughs> uh, it was about sunset, and I looked at this building and here were a whole, maybe five or six old nuns in wheelchairs. They would brought them out on the balcony so they could see the sun go down. And they were looking in my direction, so I turned around and here was a statue of the Virgin, kind of an amphitheater where those nuns used to pray. Weeds all over, <clears throat> paper coffee cups, seven-up cans, the statues all covered with pigeon crap. And I looked at those old ladies and I thought, that, that's the fate of the American white men. They, they spent all their life supporting institutions which now are collapsing so fast that they don't even understand it. All you can do is wheel them out to look at what used to be. It's a sad situation. Now, both of us ought to sit down and I don't do it. I hope that answers your question. Somewhat. <laughs> Well, I'm also a politician, and I can talk for an hour and not answer any questions. <laughs> Vine, uh, uh, I'm Gary Kimball from the Association on American Indian Affairs. What, what was his name? Gary Kimball. Oh. He works as a consultant with us, so he's surprised. Uh, Vine, one of the interesting, having moved from Portland to New York City, one of the interesting conversations I heard in New York was about John Frommeyer's attack on freedom of expression and freedom of speech, and um, his brother attacking freedom of religion. And the comment to me was that, that this was a signal to the white supremacy movement that Oregon was now a safe place to be. Could you elaborate a little bit on what you might see as to be uh, not only this is a signal uh, for white domination, but also for uh, the movement within the Nazi 
uh, organizations in this country. They got television cameras on. I'm, I'm liable to get <laughs> liable to get shot going in a bar, Gary. What? I, I'm kind of surprised that, that there's this white supremacy movement uh, for the reason that minorities are really taking it in the neck the last 30 years, you know. <laughs> and so for for whites to feel threatened at this point, uh, I, I think they're threatened about something else. Minorities are certainly no threat to anybody at the present time. And I don't think Indians really ever have been a threat because uh, every Indian meeting I've gotten to We've been so busy making unity speeches, we haven't had time to organize, so. <laughs> our, our, <laughs> our dangers are nil. I don't, I don't know from my, I saw him in the audience. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that there was ill will there. What I would say is there was appalling ignorance of what the possible results of his actions would have been. Uh, other than other than uh, David Duke and some of those, uh, just got to antagonize. I think the tragedy of the present uh, present society is we're all not very well educated. We don't spend enough time thinking about the implications of our actions. So we frequently do things that we haven't considered what's what the results are going to be. I would never take that Smith court uh, Smith case up. If I'd been Attorney General, I would have said, how many Indians are there in Oregon anyway? I said, okay, well, let's deal with important issues. I think there is some posturing by elected officials. And certainly that's going on in Oklahoma right now with, in regard to chasing Indians who are members of the Native American church. Well, I think quite often they just think it's going to be a symbolic gesture and no one's going to be hurt. At the beginning of the year, I was down in San Antonio with all the law school deans. And let me tell you, your taxpayers' dollars are not doing anything in legal education. <clears throat> I mean, I used to work as a lineman for the United States Marine Corps, and our telephone poles were smarter than that group I met with in San Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> and it, the attitude of the law deans and the law professors was the Supreme Court is a benign men's club to which one woman has been admitted, sits off here on cloud nine and thinks up interesting intellectual legal problems that law professors can then orate on. I mean, that's really their attitude. And I was on a panel with them and I, I wanted to get up and scream, hey, these things affect people in the street, in their homes when they gather. This isn't just an interesting little footnote to Oliver Wendell Holmes' uh, statement about mental defectives. This is going to happen. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, then I won't go any further because we are on the... <clears throat> but uh, I, I can't, for the most part, unless I find evidence, Gary, attribute ill will and scheming to public officials because I don't think most of them are intelligent enough to scheme. I'm Roy Polanyi, a City Club member. Uh, Mr. DeLoria, about 20 years ago, Dr. Barry Commoner uh, wrote a book, it's called The Closing Circle. And in it, he described what he thought were the four laws of ecology. Everything is connected to everything else. Everything must go somewhere. Nature knows best and there's no such thing as a free lunch. Would you think that that is fairly close to the way the American Indian feels about the whole thing? Well, yeah, but I'd like to think I had a free lunch here. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, let me remind you once again to fill out the program evaluation forms on your tables. I think we'll have some good comments today. I, uh, I want to thank once again very profoundly Vine Deloria, Jr. This has been a delightful hour and some. And come back and visit us again sometime, please. We are adjourned. <laughs>